Thank you, David Pack. Um, good morning. It's good to see everyone here on this Lord's Day. Uh, I'm glad that we're able to gather together and to worship uh, the one and true same God together. And if you are visiting with us, we just want to extend a special thank you for uh, worshiping with us. We pray that you would be blessed and that you would stick around and get to know us as we could get to know you as well. Um, it's always a great pleasure to see new faces in the congregation. Uh, with that said, if I could kindly ask everyone to please stand for the reading of God's Word. The passage this morning comes to us in a famous book, the book of Jonah, which will begin our series here for the next several months. Jonah chapter 1, verses 1 to 3. And so as I read this, please give your undivided attention to his holy word. Jonah chapter 1, verses 1 to 3. Now the word of the Lord came to Jonah, the son of Amittai, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, thy great city, and call out against it, for their evil has come up before me. But Jonah rose to flee to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. He went down to Joppa and found a ship going to Tarshish. So he paid the fare and went down into it to go with them to Tarshish, away from the presence of the Lord. This is the reading of the word. Please take your seats at this time. Well, this morning we began a new series on the book of Jonah, and it's really a wonderful and fantastic book, and so excited to see what the Lord may be able to speak to us here this morning and the several months on this wonderful book. It is called a minor prophet, minor not because of its significance, but really minor in terms of its length as compared to what they call the major prophets, such as Isaiah or Ezekiel. But it is a book rich in God's grace and God's sovereignty, rich in the gospel, rich in practical wisdom for the church. And so I'm excited to see and hope and pray that the, Lord, the word of the Lord may be able to speak into your hearts from this wonderful and fantastic book. Sinclair Ferguson, in his commentary, Man Overboard, says about the book of Jonah that the best subtitle that we could give this book is really Evangelism and the Sovereignty of God. Evangelism and the Sovereignty of God. Because when you read this book and you see that Jonah runs away from God's purposes and plan, we learn that even then against man's rebellion and disobedience, that God is still sovereign over all things, and he orchestrates life for his plan and purposes. But then we also learn that in this relationship between God and Jonah, that we notice and we can sense that the heartbeat of God pulsates with an evangelistic rhythm. It pulsates with an evangelistic rhythm. And so I think that this message, this summary by Ferguson, fits in very well with what we're trying to do here at New Life. Uh, we do want to cultivate here at this church a heart that really pulsates in unison with the rhythm of God's heart. We want people to be vibrant and spiritually well and filled with the Spirit and full of the Gospel so that we will be outward-facing and outward-thinking and other-centered so that in the various spheres of our lives and the natural relationships under God's providence, we would also be able to engage the people and to share the message of God's salvation with them and to bring them into God's community. We want this to be something natural and organic in your workplace, in your meeting places, in your meetups, and people you bump into in the coffee shop, in every, in every sphere of your life. We want you to be spiritually vibrant so that you would understand that the Word of God calls you to evangelism under the sovereignty of God because that's what we want to cultivate in this church a heart that pulsates with the evangelistic rhythm of God's heartbeat. But we also know that it's difficult to do this, so we also have certain programs that we want to place and cultivate and to really build up and evolve. In particular, I'm thinking about our community groups. And so if you're new here and you want to uh, know more about our church and get to know the people in a little bit more of an intimate way, I encourage you to come uh, talk to one of the leaders, and we could give you more information about community groups and get you plugged in. But we do view this as more of an official, formal, programmatic way in order to reach out to the people in our various communities and spheres of life and to bring them into the community and the love and grace of Jesus. And that's what we're trying to seek in this year for one of our goals in 2015. And so I think that the book of Jonah speaks into this and allows us to see, with the grace of Jesus, how we can accomplish this goal for the sake of the kingdom. But we also notice in this book of Jonah that it also speaks to the missionary involvement of Christians overseas. Because in the story of Jonah, we see the call for all Christians in the church to lay aside all our reluctance, all our disobedience, all our idolatry, and to fulfill with joy and pleasure the Lord's call to preach the gospel to every creature in the world. And this reminds us in a very encouraging way that God accomplishes this through broken vessels like Jonah and like you and me. And that's why Ferguson goes on and he comments in his book. Here then is a book which speaks to the hearts of missionaries of Christ. 
a mini orientation, a mini orientation course for overseas missions. And so that is something that is built into the fabric of our church and the way this church was built and began. So I pray that we could continue to flourish and to thrive with this evangelistic, this missionary heartbeat so that we could look at this mini orientation course of overseas evangelism. So friends, in the next coming weeks, I want you to open up your mind, but also to open up your heart. And I know that it could be scary to really allow the Word of God to flourish and by the Spirit to cultivate and to speak into your life. And it may challenge you to give up certain idolatries, certain aspirations, certain goals and agendas in your life. And that's scary. We don't, we don't want to follow that. But I do hope, even in my life and everyone's life here, and we pray that we would be open to what God's plan is for us, that we could see what God has in store, and that we could embrace the relentless grace of the Lord in your life and for the nations. And so when we look at Jonah, we'll see that in this man, in this historical figure, Jonah, who lived many years ago, Jonah, in this book, his life, reflects back to us our very own hearts and experiences. So you could see yourself in Jonah. You could see yourself. And Jonah probably sees himself in us in the church today, according to God's plan. Because we'll see in Jonah his fears, his motivations, his mood swings. We'll see what he does and doesn't do. We'll understand why he does and doesn't do what he's supposed to do. And you see that the first thing when we read the book of Jonah, that many people think about a great big fish. We assume it's a whale, but we're not really told. But we assume it's a whale. But this book is not about a great fish, friends. It's actually about a great God. And the sovereignty of God of how, in his grace, one man came through painful experience to discover the true character of a sovereign, loving God for his life through painful experience. In other words, Jonah will find the doctrine of God come alive, come alive in his experience. And the grace of God that Jonah already knew really well in years past will now come alive in his heart in a way never experienced before, causing Jonah's heart to beat with the rhythm of God's plan and purposes. And that's where we're headed in this series. As I pray that you would be in step with the Spirit to follow along where God wants you to go. But we began here this morning in the first three verses, and in these first three verses, we'll start on somewhat of a down note, and what I want to consider here this morning, in the life of Jonah, the anatomy of rejection. The anatomy of rejection, or an analysis of turning away. An anatomy of rejection or an analysis of turning away and trying to run from God. And I want to consider this in the life of Jonah from two perspectives. One, we'll look at Jonah's past, know his history, know his background, as much as we could gather from the book. And secondly, we'll look at Jonah's actual turning away and running away from God, his rejection and disobedience from God. So we'll look at the anatomy of rejection, the analysis of turning away, one from Jonah's past history, but also secondly, from the anatomy and analysis of his turning away from God. So those two points, very simply. So let's get into it. Point one, Jonah's past. Jonah's past. The Bible says a little bit about Jonah, not too much in there. Um, not only in the book of Jonah, but in other books of the Bible. But we see in these opening verses that these verses are terse and to the point. God's word comes to Jonah, so he's a prophet. But we also see that Jonah was the son of Amittai. So it's not really much there. These verses are succinct. They're to the point. This is very similar in fashion and style to many introductions to the book of many prophets. But Jonah, personally speaking, is one of those guys who I admire, who I really love to learn about. Someone I just like to see and to read about because he's strong. He's strong-minded, even stubborn, but he has tenacity. He has convictions. He was a man of God. And maybe this is true for all the prophets, but Jonah, he also had some issues, and that's why I could relate to him, that he has some sin, he has some disobedience. And what helps us to understand this, why he runs away from God in disobedience, is to look at this man's past. Now, what was he like before? Because for Jonah, we learn more about him in, in the book of 2 Kings 14 to 23, 14, 23 to 27. And in verse 25 of 2 Kings chapter 14, this is what we see. He restored the border of Israel from Lebo Hamath as far as the Sea of Arabah, according to the word of the Lord, and the God of Israel, which he spoke by his servant Jonah, the son of Amittai, the prophet, who was from Gath Hefer. See, in the book of Kings, you have to realize that it was a very dark and sinister time in the history of Israel. They were calling for a righteous king. Israel was looking for someone to lead them in the will of God. But during the times of the kings, it was really marked by sadness, rebellion, sin, syncretism, compromise in a religious faith. It was really a dark time, but that's exactly the time that Jonah spoke into the, as a prophet. He was serving under the king Jeroboam II. 
He was the successor to Elijah and Elisha. Th that was his crew. That was his entourage. That was his clique. That was his spiritual community, Elijah and Elisha. And Jonah was a prophet of God, and so this means that Jonah in his past also had tremendous spiritual blessings and privileges. He was a man marked by spiritual fruitfulness and spiritual success. Now, Jonah was already a man who was a prophet and walked with the Lord. He was used by the Lord in mighty ways, and so Jonah wasn't a rookie when he came to the book of Jonah. God didn't come to him for the first time in these first three verses. Jonah was already a leader and a prophet for God. And as a prophet in 2 Kings, Jonah's job was essentially to really call the kings and the nations to repentance and to preach and give a message of grace to restore them back into a covenantal relationship with their heavenly father. But it was also during the days of Jonah in 2 Kings where God restored the nation of Israel to its former boundaries. Now, Israel suffered under their idolatry. Their actual land shrunk. But under the prophet Jonah, God blessed them and gave them his grace so that the physical land of Israel expanded back to its original borders. And for an Israelite mind, that meant everything. And this is what really the point of what I'm trying to say is this. Jonah was a prophet who delivered this good news of a restoration to Israel. And this simply meant that Jonah had a front row, center seat, to the very mercy and grace of God. He experienced it, he was used by God, and he saw it. So then the point we come away with, how can a man who is spiritually successful, how can a man who is spiritually vibrant and saw the very grace of Jesus and God firsthand now be the same Jonah in the beginning of the book of Jonah who runs away in disobedience and rejection? How can it be the same guy? See, this Jonah who walked with God and had a deep, intimate spiritual relationship with God was the same Jonah who the Word of God comes to in verse 1 and scares Jonah away. In other words, the Word of God comes to a man who was rich in spiritual blessing and experience. Jonah had a rare pedigree, but this is a man who runs away, and he stumbles, and he falls, and he seeks to live out his own will. And as one commentary, commentator notes, no past privilege or past privileges Together, no past obedience or fruitfulness in service can ever substitute for present obedience for the Word of God. No matter how well you're doing in the past, that is no substitute for the Lord's call upon your life to present obedience. The Jonah, verse 1, is a different Jonah of 2 Kings 14 to 25. He wasn't the man he once was. He was on a spiritual decline. He was someone who was creeping in and curving in on his own selfish desires. See, if I could really water this down a bit and really try to translate it into our contemporary world and contemporary standard, this is some of you and some of, maybe even myself, will remember, uh, you know, being married for some of us and having kids and fully developed in our career, whatever that may be for you. You're thinking, man, college, those were the days when I was really vibrant in my spiritual life, that I was surrounded by a Christian community. I was so involved in campus ministry. I was so dedicated to my praise team on Sunday. I did my quiet time every day of the week. I read and prayed in my closet every day. I evangelized to people at the food court on campus. This is the people that are saying, I was so on fire. I went to every short term mission in every year. And then you look back and you compare yourself to now. You say, those were the good old days when I was on fire for God. But now I'm just chasing the American dream. I'm just grinding it out. I'm having the difficulty of parenting. I'm stuck at a no way, a no route job that goes to nowhere. And that's kind of how we feel. And we think, well, it's okay because I was vibrant once. That's good enough, isn't it? But Jonah is telling you, it doesn't matter how many missions trips you went in the past or what you've done in the past. The Lord's call upon your life is and always ever will be to an obedience in the now. In the now. So some of the questions you need to consider for yourself, friends, are this. Am I living only with the memories of an obedient life? Am I only living with the memories of an obedient life? Am I using my past spiritual obedience as a substitute or an excuse for present spiritual responsibility? Saying, I don't need to do this. I don't need to do that. I, was, I don't have time anymore. I did my part when I was in college. I did my part when I was in youth group. I did my part when I was younger, before I was married. But past spiritual obedience is never a substitute for the Lord's call to present personal covenantal obedience in the now. Because whether you were a vibrant Christian in the past or not, and I said this already, the Lord's call for obedience upon your life is always and ever will be in the present. To follow his call in the now. And this leads us to point number two. 
because the Lord calls Jonah to present obedience, and what does Jonah do? He runs away. He runs away. See, in these verses, we get an analysis or an anatomy of Jonah, Jonah's turning and his running, don't we? Verse 3, look at this with me. Verse 3. But Jonah rose to flee to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. Now, that phrase, presence of the Lord, was there twice. Literally, you could translate that as the face of the Lord. We'll look at that a little bit later. But Tarshish was west of the Mediterranean Sea. You had to go through the Strait of Gibraltar. So scholars say the best guess is that it was somewhere on the west coast of Spain. Now, what's the importance of geography? It's, impor it's important because it shows this, that the city of Tarshish was exactly opposite in direction from the city of Nineveh. So Jonah is called to go to Nineveh, but he goes exactly the opposite way. Friends, this is a metaphor of sin and disobedience. This is a pictorial representation of autonomy. This is really a picture of what they call the autonomous man. Now, autonomy comes from the word autonomos. Auto meaning unto oneself. Namos, where we get the word law. Autonomous means being a law unto oneself. And that's essentially what we see where Jonah is called to Nineveh, but he moves in the opposite direction to go to Tarshish. He was autonomous. He was autonomous. He was seeking to live a life without God, moving in the opposite direction of God. And when he does, we get an analysis of a disobedience. And this is what we see. And this may reflect our hearts back to us. First, he turns from God's word in verse 1. The word of the Lord came is what it says. Now, this is a common expression used over a hundred times in the book of prophets, in various prophets. It meant to have a fresh, clear insight to be drawn into God's presence and see things from God's perspective. That's why a prophet was also known as a seer, you know, in the same way that people could be an eater, someone who eats. A seer is someone who sees, but for a prophet, see thi sees things with clarity, sees things from the perspective of God's heart and kingdom. But this word came to Jonah, and it couldn't be stopped or halted. And this is what, rejo what Jonah rejected. The word of God came with clarity. Arise and go to Nineveh. It came with a note of reality. This was a great city. It came with a great sense of responsibility. Call out against the nation of Nineveh in their evil. But Jonah still turns away from God, and he rejects it. He runs from it. Now the question is why? Why does Jonah reject the word of God if he was such a great prophet in 2 Kings? And there are various answers. I'm going to offer you a few suggestions. First, Jonah turned away from God's word not because he had an intellectual difficulty. It's not as if he didn't understand what God wanted him to do. Let me consult my lexicons. Let me consult my commentaries. God, I don't know what you're telling me to do. It wasn't an intellectual barrier. Jonah didn't have, a trouble, have trouble understanding. Rather, Jonah's problem was moral. Moral. He had his own plans and desires. He had his own ambitions and his own assessment of the situation. You know, friends, if I could illustrate it in this way, you imagine, um, you imagine like your kid or any kid going to someone's house to play, and it's a huge, wonderful house, and you tell this kid, you could go and run and play in everywhere in the room, everywhere in the house, except this one room, which is the master bedroom, keep out of that room. Everywhere else, you can have this one room, keep out. Well, where does the kid want to go? He wants to go into the room that he can't go into. See, in the same way, this word of God comes to Jonah, and Jonah is saying, I'm going to give you, God, 90% of the house of my heart, but there's a 10% in my heart, one room in the heart of my life. Keep out, God. I don't want you to go in there. But God's word wants all of us. God's heart wants all of you. And so in some way, in some sense, God is saying 90% is enough. I want 100%. So the word of God exposes a nerve. It's sort of like a spiritual doctor. You know, he just touches that one part in Jonah's heart that he doesn't want to give up, and he gently squeezes it to see his response. In Jonah's response, he, he's shaken, he moves, and he runs away in the opposite direction. And friends, all of you, every one of us, including me, all of us, have that one room in the heart of our lives where we're saying, 90% God, it's for you. Just don't go into that one room. Don't touch that nerve, God, because it's mine. I'm not going to give it up. See, in the same way that God may be testing Jonah in a way that he never did before, exposing that nerve, God may be calling and testing every one of you here this morning in the same way. I mean, really, let's be honest, friends. You know what God's word telling you to do. You know. Maybe not everything, but you know enough. It's not as if we don't know what God wants us to do. You know, read your Bible and pray. We know a lot. We know that God's gospel, the gospel is calling you to use your money in the way for the kingdom. 
We know that God is telling you, you know that God is telling you that you need to worship well on Sundays, that you need to befriend the lonely, that you need to evangelize that coworker that you have no desire to evangelize to because you run the risk of actually being detrimental to your career. You know what the gospel is calling you to do. You know what the gospel is calling you to do, what God's heart wants you to do in the way that you raise your children, not to idolize them, not to lift them up on a pedestal, you know that God is calling you, even within the community of this church, to befriend and, be, and to be forgiving to the person in this church that you just find annoying. You know a lot of what God wants you to do. And in your own small circles, you're actually running away from God in the same way that Jonah does. Because you know, you know enough of what God is calling you to do. With all your possessions and your desires, you know what you're called to do in terms of cultivating a relationship with Jesus your quiet times and family worship. You know what God is calling you to do, but in your heart and your sin and your disobedience, you turn away from this. And part of the reason why Jonah turns away from the call of God upon his life is for several reasons, but one of the things that Jonah and the commentator say is this, that Jonah cared more about his reputation than he did about God's call. Nineveh was the capital of an enemy nation. And Jonah thought to himself, according to one commentator, how can I go to my country, my nation's enemy, Nineveh, and preach a message of grace, what can I say to my own countrymen? You know, his reputation was at stake. He cared more about the reputation of his place as a prophet more than really the kingdom and the love for the lost. He didn't want to preach a message of repentance and grace because how can he do this and turn back to his people and be called a traitor prophet? According to one man, Alexander White, he says this. As a preacher, he resonates with Jonah. He says this. When I watch the working of my heart, this is what I am compelled to write. I am Jonah, in the matter of my own reputation as a preacher, that is. For I used to say, let me die before I am eclipsed by another in my pulpit and among my people. I fought with a Jonah-like fierceness against the remotest thought of my reputation ever passing over in my day at any rate to another. I am Jonah is what this preacher says because he cared more about his reputation than being eclipsed. Friends, all of you could decree and say, I am Jonah. Why? Because in our subtle ways, and this may not be for everyone, but for a lot of us, I believe you care more about your reputation, perhaps, than really the call of God upon your life. You're saying you will fight the reputation to defend your reputation with a Jonah-like fierceness in every sphere of your life. Some of you are saying, I have a reputation of being very charismatic and gifted. I have a reputation of being holy, a leader. I, I'm very, very capable. I have a reputation of being very successful, very intellectual, very accomplished in the academic realm. I care more about that reputation than God's call to forsake all of this and lay down my life before the cross and follow his call for the sake of the nations. Many of you turn away from God's word because like Jonah, you care more about your reputation. And the word of God is calling you to turn away. But another thing that Jonah is called to do and struggles with in this anatomy of rejection is that he didn't just care about his reputation, but he also cared and misunderstood the Lord's grace. Because he didn't want the city of Nineveh to be forgiven and restored. And Nineveh was the capital of Assyria. The nation of Assyria robbed and ravaged, plundered and dominated the nation of Israel. They were like the enemy team. They were the arch rival. And Jonah didn't want to extend grace to them. He wanted it to hoard all the grace for himself and his own people. And you're thinking to yourself, man, Jonah is such a selfish guy. He's a prophet. Doesn't he want the nations to be saved and see the glory of God? Well, according to most commentators, he doesn't. He just wanted to hoard the grace for himself because it's hard to extend grace to your enemy, isn't it? Think about it in your own individual lives. Now, this is someone who's called to extend grace to a nation, but even of ourselves, before we're too critical of Jonah and saying, I would have done what Jonah couldn't do. Of course I would have. Well, let's not be too quick here. Because if we're honest, Jonah mirrors back to us our own hearts. Jonah reflects our own sin. Do we really want joy and grace given to those people, even in this church or out of this church, for those individual lives and relationships that you don't like too much? Do you really want joy and grace given to your quote-unquote enemies, the people that you don't like, the people that you have a difficulty engaging and relating to? And is that really you? No, do you really want joy and grace for that family member who criticizes your parenting style, for that person in this church who really just boasts in the way that he's more successful than someone else? Do you really want joy and grace on a much smaller scale when the wor God, Word of God is calling you to go and reconcile, be gracious, and ask forgiveness for the person who has sinned against you? Do you really want that in your life? See, if you say no, friends, you on a much smaller scale 
are committing the same sort of difficulty that Jonah is struggling with. And the Word of God is calling you to expand your life and your grace, even in the smaller scale to the people in this room. And last but not least, what we consider is this, in the anatomy of Jonah's rejection. He turns from the Word of God because he cares more about his reputation and has a misunderstanding of grace. But Jonah also turns from God. He rejects God because he's fleeing from God's presence. See, the phrase there, presence of the Lord, is there twice in verse 3, and it means the face of the Lord. And so Jonah was a good theologian. He knew that he couldn't run away from God's presence. He knew that God was omnipresent. He knew that God was everywhere. But Jonah, in some sense, wasn't fleeing the literal presence of God. He was fleeing the felt presence of God. Now, you ever see your child get in trouble, or any kid, for that matter, get in trouble? And you take him aside, and you begin to scold him and to discipline him, and the child looks up, but they can't look you in the eye because he's too embarrassed or feels so bad. So he just keeps looking down and says, yeah, I'm sorry, that's that's what I did. I'm I'm sorry, I'm a bad person. Because that child is not able to look in the face of the Lord because it lessens the presence of the Lord. See, in the same way that a child cannot look in your face when he's being scolded, he wants to move away from the felt presence of your scolding, but he knows that all the while you are in the literal physical presence of the scolding. And so Jonah, in the same way, knew that he can't flee the literal presence of God, but he wants to move from the felt presence of God. You know, Jonah literally left God's community, and he went to a place called Tarshish. He's moving away from the place of prayer, the place of God's community, the church. He's moving away from the community of believers. Douglas Stewart writes this, Jonah, the ardent nationalist, therefore attempted to flee to a place where no fellow believers would be found, hoping that this would help ensure that God's word would not come to him again. See, it's very rational if you're trying to understand why did Jonah wa- move away from God's presence? Because most often than not, more often than not, God's prophecy came to the prophets while the prophet was living in the community of God's people. So logically, if the prophet moved away from God's people, he could think, well, I'm away from the national land. I'm, wa- I'm away from God's people. Maybe if I move away from God's people, then God's word would no longer come to me. So that's a very understandable, rational, logical explanation. If he stayed in Israel, he would hear God again. If he left, maybe he wouldn't hear anything. He's fleeing from God's presence. And so Jonah reflects again back to us our own hearts and sins because Jonah serves friends, serves us this morning, not as a word of condemnation, but as a word of warning to not shipwreck your life. See, Jonah, friends, was a man of character and outward godliness, but he was also in spiritual decline. So if you look at these characteristics, be honest with yourself. If these characteristics reflect you and reflect your personality in your life, it may be very true that you are in a spiritual decline. Are you rejecting God's word? Do you care more about your reputation than God's call in your life? Do you deny your responsibilities, not necessarily as a prophet, but as a disciple of Jesus and a member of this church? Do you constantly withdraw and avoid Christian fellowship and community? because you want to flee the presence of the Lord? No, this is sort of the people that you hear about, that back in the day, they were a spiritual leader in the church or a campus fellowship. But then you hear this person no longer even attends church. That is a clear mark of a spiritual decline. Do these characteristics reflect you? Because, friends, if they do, it shows that you're on a path towards shipwreck. And the application is this for us here this morning as we come to a close. If this describes you, if this describes your personality and your heart, your, in, your, your inclinations, your aspirations, then what we have to consider here and what Jonah should have done is this. You need to tend to your heart. Jonah, in some sense, didn't necessarily have a physical breaking of the law or sin, but he had a lot of sin within his heart that he had to tend and to take care of. See, the lesson here is a way of warning is to say, you need to be a gardener and tend to the difficulties and sins of your lives. Tend to your heart. Is there a bitterness in your heart that you're cultivating about life, about family members, about circumstances? Why is this happening to me? Is there a difficulty in your life that you need to tend because someone sinned against you and you never forgave that person? And that sin, that lack of forgiveness, that bitterness is building up, that your heart now has become a bed soil for bitterness and entitlement and resentment? Do you feel like the world is against you every and every sense of the way? That you feel like, I should be in this position, I should be like this, I should have this, but for some reason I'm not, and you feel so entitled, and you don't confess it before the Lord, so you build up this bitterness. If you're not, if, you, if you're like this, you may be like Jonah on a path of rejection.
and this passage is calling you to tend to your heart, and that leads us to this. How do you tend to your heart? Give your heart over to Jesus. See, the picture of Jonah shows us and points to us that there is a new and greater and better Jonah in the person and work of Jesus. See, in the same way that Jonah rejected God's call to go to the city of Nineveh, Jesus did what Jonah couldn't do. And Jesus didn't just go to Nineveh, but Jesus accepted the call of his heavenly Father to not just go into a city that was a bastion of evil, but to come into the world that was a bastion of hell. And and Jesus came into this world. And he lived the perfect life. And he died the perfect death. And Jesus raised him from the dead three days later. Because Jesus did what Jonah couldn't do. And if you give your heart and your life to Jesus in this way, it'll melt your heart. You'll be saturated with the grace of Jesus. So that no longer would you be running and turning away from God, but you could cultivate a heart of forgiveness and love and grace to every member and every person in this world, that your heart finally in the cross can beat and pulsate with the evangelistic rhythm of God's heartbeat. If you give your life to Jesus, if you dedicate your life to him once more, and say to God, I open up my life, it's yours, take it, and do whatever you please. I'm willing to sacrifice anything for you. God will open up a new way for you, and he'll give you a path of righteousness and holiness where you can experience the fulfillment and joy in life that you have never experienced before. So lay down your life before him, friends. Open up your heart and give it to him because he has given his very own son for you. Let us pray at this time. Father, we thank you so much. We thank you so much, Lord, that you give us a story of someone enigmatic but encouraging, relatable man, Jonah. Lord, we thank you, Lord, that this message isn't ultimately about Jonah, but it is about the true and greater Jonah in Jesus Christ. We thank you, Lord, that Jesus did not run in disobedience, but with wholehearted joy and love and grace, he pursued your will, and he came crashing into this world in the gospel upon the cross, ushering in a new age and a new kingdom, a new spirit that enables your church to follow hard after you and to have a heart and a vision for the sake of the nation so that we could share the love of Jesus through the proclamation of the gospel. So, Lord, I pray that you would speak into each and every one of our hearts here, that many of us have idols and rooms in our hearts that we won't give up. May you, by your grace, help us to see the greater joy in Jesus that we could give and be willing to sacrifice whatever you may call us to do. So, Lord, we thank you and pray that you would make this a truth and reality in our church. We pray that we do this all for the sake of the name of Jesus Christ.